Good morning and welcome to Today with Dwayne Miller. I am Dwayne Miller and I'm delighted, excited, and exhilarated really to be coming into your home today or into your place of business or wherever you might be watching us around the world. Yes, you can watch us live stream around the world at vtntv.com or you can tune in right here to VTN on its various channels across this region. So thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited about this teaching this week in the book of Ephesians about who you are in Christ and how that Christ has already blessed us with every blessing and he's already positioned us in heavenly places so that you and I, through the mystery of his will, may bring heaven to earth. That's right. That's what I said. It's God's will, the mystery of his will for you and I to bring heaven to earth. That's why he placed his spirit within us. So I'm going to be teaching about that a little bit more today, and I want you to stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting broadcast. Thank you for your prayer requests. The greatest honor and privilege that I have is praying for you. I'm saying that just as genuinely as I know how. I'd love to pray for you, and I want you to email me your prayer request every day. You can go to the website, DwayneMiller.com, email me your prayer request, or you can call the number on the screen and tell us your prayer request, and we'll write it down and add it to our list. Or you can send it to me via snail mail, if you will, the old-fashioned way, P.O. Box 242480, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72223. Please. Let me pray for you. Will you do that? And I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that sovereign, divine revelation knowledge be revealed, that you remove the scales from our eyes. There, there are people listening today that are hurt, they're bound. Religion has blinded their eyes to the glorious truth of who we are in Christ. So God, it's my desire today that you break the darkness and the blinders off of our eyes and we see the revelation of who you really are and who we are in you. God, I pray for a transformation to take place today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Well, I hope you got your Bible. We're in Ephesians chapter one. We have made our way in three programs down through verse number six. And the apostle Paul breaks out into a praise session. The, the chapter one of the book of Ephesians in reality is a doxology. It is Paul praising the Father for the glory of his grace. And he praised him because he blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And he told us what those were. He, uh, some of what they were, he said, we, we've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We have been adopted into the family. We've been accepted in the beloved. That's what we dealt with yesterday. We have been highly favored. That's what the word uh, beloved, accepted in the beloved actually means. And then now the apostle Paul is going to praise the son for the riches of his grace. He praises the father for the glory of his grace. He praises the son for the riches of his grace. And can I just say, don't you love Jesus? Man, aren't you thankful for who you are and what he's made you and who he is in you? Oh, hallelujah. What are these riches? Well, let's begin in verse number seven. And as a matter of fact, I want you to follow along in your translation. I want to read this to you in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This is a, a Southern Baptist translation that I think is very accurate to the Greek and especially right here in this passage. Listen to what it says. We have redemption in him through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. We've also received an inheritance in him, predestined according to the purpose of the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in the Messiah might bring praise to his glory. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful translation. I'm telling you that Paul is letting us know as the saints and faithful of God, given the grace and the peace of God, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing 
Paul breaks out into a praise session, as you and I should every day. Praise you, Father, that you chose me, you adopted me, you have accepted me. Praise the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Jesus, for the riches of your grace. Now, what are those riches? Well, let's look right here in verse number seven again. For we have redemption. We have. We've already possessed it. We're not living for redemption. We've been redeemed. We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Look at this, redemption. Can I say to you today that redemption has a price? Redemption has a price. What is the price of our redemption? His blood. Oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, don't ever take for granted or fall into this modern trap of minimizing the blood of Jesus. Calvary is the place where his blood was shed. You know, I find that many times the modern message of Calvary is in fact offensive to people. But the message of Calvary is, is the truth of the fact that God's willing to forgive because God's a God of love, because God has, has prepared himself to forgive us. He, he brought Jesus Christ to Calvary, that place where his blood was shed. Calvary is the proclamation of God's love for us. When God wanted to show the world that he so loved them, he gave his only begotten son. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. God bankrupt heaven and gave heaven's best for our worst. He gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come to Calvary. Calvary is the means whereby we can be forgiven. Unfortunately, in this modern age, so many seeker-friendly messages come to show us, uh, tell us that Jesus came to show us the way. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the way. He didn't come to show me the way. He is the way. He's the only way. Leading me, giving me, granting me, buying for me, delivering me into eternal life. Calvary was necessary. If you think for a moment that the cross of Jesus Christ was unnecessary, you have totally misunderstood the human condition. The human condition is that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We were born with sin nature. We inherited that from Adam. We, we are a fallen race. The human condition is without hope, undone. The human condition is in a position that's impossible. But Calvary said to us, I love you this much. Calvary is the place where God laid upon Jesus the sin of humanity. Think about that. Every sin of humanity. The Department of Eugenics says there have been at least 32 billion people who've lived on this earth since Adam. Every sin of all 32 billion, Jesus became at Calvary. Calvary is the place of our redemption. The cross is the punishment for our sin. Isaiah says, but he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was on him. And we're healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We, we've all turned our own way and the Lord punished him for the iniquity of us all. The Bible said in Philippians 2, 8, that he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of a cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the sinless lamb, the spotless lamb. He was willing to lay down the glory that was rightfully his. He was willing in his deity to become humanity. He was willing to bear the sin burden for mankind. He was willing to be put to an open shame. He was willing to be beaten until he would have died had an angel not ministered to him. He, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that when we think about the cross, it's not just some sort of symbol that we use as a trinket or we use to adorn ourselves with our jewelry, but the cross is a place where God poured out the wrath and judgment that belonged to us on his son. 
Please don't let that pass by you quickly. Please do not approach the cross flippantly or take it for granted. Hear me today. We have redemption in him, the forgiveness of sin, because God took his wrath and poured it out on his son. And God took his judgment and poured it out on his son. People tend to criticize me because I always make the statement that there is no judgment for sin. You never see Jesus condemning anyone for their sin. And the reason that there's no more judgment for sin in the believer is because he was judged. Jesus Christ took the wrath of God. Now watch this. Jesus took the wrath of God for all sin, for all time, for all humanity. And if we access that gift of grace, that redemption through his blood by faith, we're never judged for sin anymore. I can remember times in my life thinking in church, oh my gosh, one day I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And I am, but I'm not going to be judged for my sin. The judgment seat of Christ is the Bema. It's a reward ceremony. It's a celebration. My sin has already been judged in Jesus at the cross. Hallelujah. My sin has been judged in him. He paid the price so that I don't have to pay. You say, well, pastor, what about the things that I do and the things that I struggle with and the things that I, that I yet will do? He was judged. God does not judge you. He judged his son. Religion loves to judge. Religion loves to put you in bondage. Religion loves to use a spirit of control and manipulation to produce a conduct that causes religion to receive glory. But Jesus became our sin and was judged so that Jesus can receive all the glory because now I am free from sin and death. Hell, and the, I'm free from judgment and condemnation. Hallelujah. If you're living under condemnation, that's not from God. That is religion that has placed you in bondage. So the cross is a place of judgment. Calvary is a place of redemption and his blood is the cost of that redemption. That word redemption is apolutrosis. Apolutrosis in the Greek is a ransom. He gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2, 6, Matthew 20, 28. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to give his life a ransom. There are a couple of illustrations here from this word ransom. It is a slave as a result of being captured. A slave who has been captured in the Old Testament, in that culture, if you were indebted and you could not pay your debt, then your family would become the slaves of the creditor. And then there would be a time and a season where the kinsman redeemer, the, the nearest of kin could come and purchase you back, could ransom you and pay the ransom price. As a matter of fact, if a kinsman redeemer were to come to purchase you back, one of the things that would happen is, is that they would have you on that auction block. And, and let's just suppose the rightful redeemer said, I, I, I don't want you. I'm not going to purchase you. But there's another relative who will. They'd take off their shoes and wave them in the air and say, I surrender. That's what God was saying to Moses when he came to the burning bush. Take your shoes off, Moses. Surrender. I'm your redeemer. Surrender, Moses. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ took off his shoes, surrendered his life so that we could be redeemed. He, he redeemed us. He is our kinsman redeemer. Uh, another illustration of this word apolutrosis is like a pawnbroker who loans money for an object and then that object's left as collateral and then someone comes and redeems that object. Jesus has bought us out of slavery and Jesus has redeemed us from bondage, hallelujah, in whom we have redemption through his blood. I've spent a long time on that statement, I know, but I want to drive home to you that Jesus Christ paid that price. Why did God 
not say that it's through the death of Jesus, but he says we have redemption through his blood. He said we don't have redemption through his death, we have redemption through his blood. There's a significant reason. There's a lot of people out there who identify with the death of Jesus, but they don't want to identify with the blood of Jesus. Well, only the blood of Jesus is the ransom price. In Romans 3, 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through his blood. Ephesians 2, 13, we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 12, it's neither by the blood of goats nor calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin, Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins according to his own blood. Blood answers all things. There's a principle in the Bible called the law of first mention. We learned that in Systematic Theology 101. If the Bible says something first, then it will be true about that thing every time since. So whatever the Bible says about blood first, it's true from then on. And so we read in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, how that the blood, God said, the, the blood of Abel cry out to me from the ground. The law of first mention is, is that innocent bloodshed spoke to God. But Jesus came to bring a better sacrifice. What is he saying? He's saying that the blood of Jesus answers back illegitimate death. The blood of Jesus answers back sin and the curse and all that takes place. He, blood answers all things. God heard the cry of the innocent blood of Abel and God answered it with the blood of his son. Hallelujah. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west, remembers it no more because of the blood of his son. So we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, according to the riches of his grace. Plutus is according to the wealth and the abundance. Paul, especially in the book of Ephesians, Paul, he is enamored by the grace of God as we should be. I mean, he just can't get over it. Paul over and over and over talks about the grace of God, the grace of God. He says in Ephesians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us that in the ages to come he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace. He says in chapter 3, verse 8, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ that I could prove to the saints, he says in verse 8, the grace that was given preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. You understand the grace of God that Paul's talking about here, that we have redemption in his blood according to the riches of his grace, that is our provision. The forgiveness of our sins and trespasses according to God's grace. Paul prayed in chapter one, verse 18, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that we may know what is the riches of the glory of our inheritance. What has grace provided for us? Through the riches of the blood of Jesus, Grace provided the price, his blood. Grace provides the way. Grace gives us details of that total provision, how, how that God made his grace abound toward you and toward me. The grace of God is free. He required nothing of us. The grace of God is full, meaning he gave us the full measure of everything he is and has. The grace of God is complete, restoring back all that was lost. The grace of God gives assurance Having been justified by faith, we have now peace with God. The grace of God has given us our adoption, access into his presence, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the unconditional love of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. I know I'm kind of overwhelmed here, but the grace of God is a reason to be overwhelmed. Paul praises the Father for the glory of his grace, and Paul praises the Son for the riches of his grace. What are the riches of his grace? In him we have, have redemption through his blood according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption and we have revelation that he lavished his love on us with all wisdom and understanding, has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. 
Paul said, God's riches of his grace have abounded to you through his son, Jesus Christ, so that he could reveal to you the mystery of his will. What is the mystery of God's will? That in the dispensation, that, that in this dispensation, we might fulfill and know the will of God. Listen to me. God says that he lavished that grace on us that with all wisdom, wisdom is Sophia. Wisdom is to make clear. Wisdom is the knowledge, the understanding. And then he says, not only wisdom, but then understanding, phronesis, literally insight. God gives you knowledge. And then the understanding is the insight the, to, to give revelation of the knowledge. Let me say that again. Wisdom is God gives you knowledge. And then revelation is he gives you insight into the knowledge according to the mystery of his will. That God planned through his grace to give us revelation in this hour, the mystery of his will concerning our life. That in this dispensation, look at verse 10. Man, I love this because this is the theme. That word dispensation is a koinomia. In the economy of God, in the economy, the master plan, in the master plan of God, the builder of his kingdom, in this master plan, God in the fullness of the dispensations. So to be a little bit technical here, you have plerumatos tun kairun. Obviously, Kairun is where we get the word kairos, a decided, decisive moment. God, in the economy of his kingdom, in the fullness of times, okay, has, and God has set a, 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 an exact time, an exact order, a consummation of the ages. Let me, let me try to simplify this for you. Through the grace of God, the fact that we have been redeemed by his grace, and that now we've been given his wisdom so that we might have insight into this moment, this Kairos moment, that God himself is showing us a mystery that he may fulfill his kingdom in and through us by causing us to bring heaven to earth so that those things which are in heaven and on earth in him may come together. This is a phenomenal prophetic revelation. And be honest with you, I'm not going to have time to finish it today. This is actually, if you like Bible prophecy, this is a Bible prophecy revelation concerning the church and the Jews who become completed in the Messiah as one new man. So tomorrow, okay, the last day of this week, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the supernatural revelation of God concerning you and I bringing heaven to earth. Now, before you leave me today, let me just say this. I want to tell you that you could come and have this kind of revelation every Sunday at Cross Life Church right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We meet at 21 Rawling Circle. And let me say something about Cross Life Church. I don't talk a lot about it because I want to spend my time teaching, but Cross Life Church of Little Rock has the most dynamic children's program, the most dynamic children's church. Pastor Chris Glidewell does a phenomenal job with our children. Your children will leave. I promise you, we hear this every week. My children says we have to come back because they love Pastor Chris and Children's Church. We teach them the word, the word, the word, the word. We do it in a very fun and powerful way. Bring your kids to Cross Life Church of Little Rock and let us teach them the word of God while their minds are still a lot younger than ours and able to comprehend. Bring your grandchildren. We have a phenomenal children's ministry. We have a phenomenal praise and worship ministry. You'll be blessed by the atmosphere of Cross Life Church in Little Rock. Pastor Crystal Brazel and her team do a phenomenal job. And we give the Holy Spirit time to move. We are not on the clock. I'm just going to be honest with you. We come, and while we're good stewards of your time, we entertain the presence of God, the gifts of the Spirit, the prophetic operates. So please, Come and experience the praise and worship ministry and the children's ministry. We have a singles ministry. We have a tremendous singles pastor, Ron Atkinson, who's doing a great job with our singles. We have a women's ministry, Pastor Lisa Blair, a spirit-filled, dynamic woman of God. Okay, and Pastor Ron has a great men's ministry. We, I'm telling you, we have a lot going on 
in Cross Life Church of Little Rock. Come see us at 10.30 a.m. at Noah's Event Venue, 21 Rawling Circle. 10.30, 21 Rawling Circle. Come see me every Sunday and experience the powerful, dynamic Word of Faith changing your life. Come, if you need prayer, come and let me pray for you personally. We pray for people every Sunday, laying hands on them and believing. So you come and experience that at Cross Life Church of Little Rock. We have a website that you can look us up, Cross Life Church, and see what's going on there in Little Rock. So go to DwayneMiller.com for a gift of any size. I'll sow my book, Jesus Rabbi, into your life. If you'd become a monthly partner, I will send you a CD or DVD every month. I will speak into your life every day through a private uh, Facebook page. If you will become a hundred dollar a month partner, please. You say, well, I don't have a hundred dollars a month. That's okay. One dollar a month, five dollars, 10, no gifts too small. Every gift you give helps us do this. We broadcast right here on vtntv.com or right here on the network every morning at 4.30 and 10.30 or 10, I'm sorry, 10 a.m. Join me each and every day at vtntv.com. If you have loved ones across the world, they can join us live stream or watch on demand. If you miss one of our broadcasts, remember, you can go to vtntv.com, find my name on the broadcasters. You can watch the messages that have been archived. I'm Dwayne Miller and I love you. Jesus loves you. I want you to love yourself and believe in your own destiny. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. him today. You came to worship him. You didn't come to hear a sermon. You didn't come to see me. You didn't come to sing a song. You came to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you're going to hear a word today that's going to literally be for you and your future.